an entire world is ready for you to start your career teaching the path to wellness. Mastering the science of mindfulness and the art of coaching to help clients achieve mental, emotional, and physical betterment of life through movement, nutrition, recovery, and regeneration. Because impacting one person impacts a family. Impacting a family impacts a community. And impacting a community impacts the world. Become an NASM Certified Wellness Coach. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Master Instructor Roundtable. I'm Marty Miller here with my fellow regional master instructor, Miss Wendy Batts. Wendy, how's everything going today? Oh, so good. And I'm so excited about today. <laughs> Man, I could just even tell, like I could sense it even before we just started. So, you know, here's the thing. I got to do the formal, right? So I'm going to I'm going to read our special guest formal bio, but then you and I can kind of kind of, you know, make it informal and talk a little bit about them. But we have a special guest today that Wendy and I um, are so excited for. We both uh, have known this gentleman for uh, over 17, 18 years and owe a lot of our career success to Mr. Rodney Korn. So Rodney has over 30 years of experience in health and fitness industry as a personal trainer, strength conditioning coach, therapeutic exercise technician, international educator, presenter, author, researcher, and university adjunct faculty member. He is currently the director of Aleco Education, which promotes performance, learning, and knowledge through world-class education and products to help people be stronger so they perform better in sports and life. Here's the key point. Rodney was also the former director of education for the National Academy of Sports Medicine, co-founder and COO of Personal Training Academy, PTA Global, and co-founder of Feel Soma, which is self-osteomyofascial applications. But Wendy, why don't you just tell everyone who Rodney is to us? So, Honestly, like when, when Marty and I got hired, we got hired um, at the same time with Tony Amblerite and another one of our uh, master instructors, Larry Husted. And Rodney was tasked on helping Marty and all of us, and myself included, on how to go out and present the NASM material without sounding terrible, without looking nervous, and to give us these cues and ways to explain it to people that were new to NASM. Oh, you're being nice. I thought you were going to say he was he was tasked with scaring the heck out of us. But yes, if you okay. ask Rodney a question, you better know the answer before you ask the question because he will come back and say, well, what do you think it is? <laughs> well, what do you think it is? And so, therefore, you better have some idea of what you think the answer is if you are going to ask him a question, which personally, I think I learned so much more with him doing that and I know that's where Marty always says you can't shoot a canoe out of, or a, a cannon yeah, out of a canoe. canoe. We learned a lot about the banana pin. Remember that? Um, oh, yeah. And uh, and I don't know. I just absolutely adore this man. He is not only you know our one of our mentors, but just he's a beautiful person inside and out. And just I'm so excited that he's here with us today. Absolutely, I was excited as well. There he is, Mr. Rodney Corn. There he is, in the oh, flesh. Wow. Ronnie, thank you for being here. And did you know you scared us back then, 17 plus years ago? No, I did not know I scared you. That was why we developed the banana pin. The <laughs> banana pin was to lighten it up and make things a little bit more uh, fluffy. No, to be fair, I wouldn't say scare, like intimidating, like mean. Scare that we're like, oh my God, do we have the knowledge yes. to represent this company? And to your credit, and I, th I think that to, to this day, the way Wendy and I teach is how you taught us is take the complex and make it simple and digestible. And that's how people fall in love with this content and have that curiosity to learn. And Rodney, I don't know if you know this, but we were just talking about children before we came on. You know, I have three boys. One of my twins is following now into the NASM footsteps and he's taking his personal training. And guess how I ask, answer his questions? The Rodney Corn method. Well, Ryan, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's vitally important because one of the big things with, with teaching is sometimes we teach people how to teach based on a slide presentation or based on a set information. But if you don't have background information, if you don't know what's behind that, right. then you're going to get stuck sooner or later very quickly, very easily. So that was to motivate Yep. It's all about motivation. 
And, and I'll speak for Wendy and I probably on this is I think we could have learned the science ourselves, but I think one of the most valuable things I took away from you, there's so many is all being a humble teacher, right? It's a privilege to be there. And it's a, and I remember you clearly saying it is, it's never about us teaching. It's about, did we disseminate the information for the people that got there and can they digest it and can they use it? Those were some key points, but mm-hmm. I think also you just made us curious to want to learn more. Yes. And I mean, and to Marty's point, I mean, you always said you can be the smartest person in the room and you can use these big words, but if no one understands what you're saying, they left the room and you are a terrible teacher. (laughs) So, um, you know, and and Marty and I still 17 to 18 years later are like, okay, you know, how do we make this simple to your, to you at your point? And then, you know, I, I don't know. And then how do you teach it in a clear fashion where people can actually make it applicable So when they go to the gym the next day, they can actually apply what we're talking about rather than just sitting there like, I have no idea what I just learned. So, yeah, absolutely. And how how much more important was that when you take in the information that we were delivering at NESM at the time, especially, which was groundbreaking back in 2000 when we started this whole process, especially when Mike Clark came on. I mean, how groundbreaking was that and how completely different of a paradigm it was so if we didn't have that capability and understanding as educators through NASM, NASM would not be where it is today. And that's not because of me. That's because of all the people that have influenced me to this point. And that's having made many, many mistakes. But you <laughs> learn from those. <laughs> well, Rod, I'm going to throw a question right out at the beginning because, you know, we do want to talk about the history of NASM and we've sure. done that before. But. I, what I find fascinating is you were, if I'm not mistaken, the director of education and you were teaching a methodology and you had an open mind. You saw somebody else teaching something. You must have had a light bulb moment. And then you went out and brought that person in to recreate the entire education. And this is, again, a long time ago when some of these methodologies were not common. So can you kind of talk about that process? Because I think that's amazing that you had that vision to where NESM could be. Yeah, so that's a a great question, and I'll try to be as precise and concise and simplistic as possible. In 1999, I was just coming out of my master's degree program. Uh, The desire was to go get a PhD, but an opportunity came, and sometimes things interrupt your your plans. And I had just come out of a master's degree program. I had just gotten my CSCS through the NSCA. I was doing some strength conditioning. One of the biggest things at that time that was different than what was in the industry, the fitness industry was in the NSCA and the strength conditioning world, there was specific programming. There was a periodization process that had been developed. And so I had come out of that, but I realized that there's there's an understanding there's different types of muscle, muscle fibers, and you get all that physiology, which no one really ever explains why that's important. We just hear about, okay, there's this and that. What I started doing before I got to NASM is I started using different training methods, um, more out of curiosity. So I was doing a lot of uh, unilateral motions and I was understanding how that puts different stresses on the body, knowing that there's a different load that can be used and how that works. And so I was starting to formulate this thought process in my head through the strength conditioning that I was doing with a lot of the athletes that I was working with at the time. Fast forward, I got a... Had, a, had an awesome story, which I won't go into how I got to NSM, but I got in front of Neil Spruce. Neil Spruce hired me, came on when I, when I got on. Uh, interestingly enough, my lab instructor, my exercise physiology lab instructor for my master's degree program, ended up getting a job and left before I left where I was going to school at Chico State. He got a job with the Lake, uh, sorry, he got a job with uh, Apex that Neil owned. And he ended up transferring into the NASM division because Neil Spruce owned both of those. He got me the interview with Neil Spruce. He then left the company. Lenny Parasino, who was another phenomenal person, uh, and I learned so much from Lenny. And Lenny left, had, he put in his two-week notice when I showed up. So I showed up and I was basically by default director of education. <laughs> so that's one way to, that's one way to like get right to the top. Uh, but I started piecing this together and I realized real quick, you know what, there's so much more that needs to be done. And there were so many brilliant people in the industry, Gary Gray, there was Paul Check, there was all these people. And so I was reaching out to these people to try to figure out how we can create 
uh, comprehensive system in the fitness industry. Meaning, how do we have a strategic programming? Because at the time, NESM didn't have programming. We talked about mechanics of motion. Well, that's great, but it's very pigeonholed and it doesn't provide a practical experience. I, I'm, I'm about practicality. How, how does that, what does it mean to me? What, what is it going to help anyone else do? So as I was talking and I was going around and I was looking at things, I, I, I by accident, was just, I went to a Vern, not by accident, but I went to Vern Gambetta was doing a programming lecture. And Vern Gambetta is very well known and he's been around for a long time. He's a fantastic person. Unfortunately, his programming lecture wasn't that, uh, it just wasn't very practical. It didn't, didn't touch base. However, he had this young kid come in and I called him young kid because he was young, Mike Clark. And so Mike comes in, he does this whole thing on an overhead squat and what that means and how the body works and linking up the chain. And, and I was like, holy crap, that's really good. And so I started connecting with Mike and talking to Mike and I went to Arizona and he had his OPT, his optimal performance training workshop. It was a two and a half day workshop. Lenny and I showed up to that. We went through that whole process and I just was like, all of this stuff I was trying to create. And I had these three phases of training that I was working on, on my own about how you go from working kind of a, a what we call stability into going more into strength power. Well, he had it all laid out. I was like, well, there's no sense of recreating the wheel. Right. So I, uh, I and, and it worked out great for Mike, but I had to kind of convince him and swindle him into coming to NESM and got him and Neil together. Neil was doing a workshop in Arizona. They met at a holiday, not a holiday. It was a holiday. A holiday in, in Arizona where Neil was teaching an Apex workshop. And they talked, sat down and, and agreed that Mike would come on. Mike came on and rest is history. So that's, Amazing. that's how it worked is realizing that I'll step out of the limelight, bring him in, take this so we can actually unfold a process that would be far more brilliant. And it was, it became better than what Mike originally had. And that was in Mike's words too. I'm not just saying that, but what Mike originally put on paper, what he had, that was the foundation of it, but we turned it into a much, much more effective, practically effective process. Awesome. And that's when you took Mike away from me in Arizona and shipped him to California. <laughs> yeah, then you came back and joined him anyway, so it didn't matter. I know. You know, that's just, that's how it's always been, apparently. So where he goes, we follow. Um, but, uh, you know, Rodney, like I said, you've been such a huge influence because you were the, the main piece that got the curriculum that we know today through NASM from Mike into, into our methodology and what we teach and everything. So, I mean, we owe a ton of that to you. Um, but, you know, obviously throughout the years, you know, you've gone and done some amazing things. So, you know, like you've authored and, and all the stuff that Marty said in your bio, but now you're the director of Aleco. And mm -hmm. so if anyone has seen the topic that we're talking about today, it's waffle irons, weightlifting, and OPT. So we have <laughs> our amazing person here today, Rodney Korn yeah. on the Master Instructor Roundtable with Marty Miller and I. So when we're talking about the, the history of NASM and how you were you know, such a huge part of, of Marty and I's lives and, and our education and growth, especially through NASM, can you tell us a little bit about Aleco itself, but then why do we even have waffle irons in the title? So can you, you let us, let us hear your wisdom of why that is. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic story and it's part, it's quite honestly, it's part of a major part of the legacy of, of Aleco in the strength training world. Uh, Aleco is an, an old company and Aleco actually stands for electrical installation company. And so you have the electrical installation company. And that's because it's a Swedish company. It's, it was in Sweden and that's why there's a K instead of a C. And, and originally it was all about providing appliances. And one of the primary appliances was the waffle iron. And I'll show you how that's so important to the legacy because later on as that company went went forward as we got into kind of the fifties weightlifting was a huge component of what was happening in the world, the Olympic weightlifting, powerlifting competitions, et cetera. And one of the employees at Aleco at the time was a weightlifter and he was going into competitions. And what he found out is in these competitions, these bars would break, they would be bent 
and then they would break and they would go through multiple bars at a competition. So he came back to the owner who at the time uh, was a woman because her husband had passed away and she was the the owner of the company, which that was a landmark thing back in those, those times. He said, hey, can we, because they worked with steel, can we make a bar? Can we actually make some type of bar that we can use? So they used the Swedish steel, which is an immaculate steel, very pure and is part of the, the whole reason why Aleko has the, the, the legacy they do with the barbell. And they said, yeah, so they made this barbell and then it was used. And for the first time ever in the history of a weightlifting competition, that one bar lasted the whole entire the whole entire uh, competition without being broken or bent. And so that started the legacy. Now, part of that is on those bars, they had this knurling and the knurling is kind of the rough jagged part of the bar that people see. And they all know about the knurling, but they, they got the idea for the knurling from the waffle liner because the knurling, if you magnify it, is the same knurling or the same pattern as you would see in a waffle iron that creates the bumps in the waffle iron, in a waffle. So that's where the knurling came in was they used the waffle iron as the, the prototype for the, the knurling and the barbell. And so that was part of where this waffle irons come from. And to this day, we have a waffle day every year at Alaco. It's kind of a worldwide thing where we have waffles and they have, there's different, and they still have numerous ones of the original waffle irons from way back in the day that they used to make waffles. So that's, awesome. that's, that's so cool. cool. <laughs> You learn something new every time you're around Roddy. Well, who would have thought that the electrical uh, installation company would come up with a barbell that was the only barbell ever last the whole competition? Never would have guessed. The caveat to that is that the bumper plates also came from a Lego. So one of the employees said, hey, I wonder if we take one of these metal plates and we put a, ba- a bicycle tire around it. What would that do? So that's where that came from. And then we created the mold and created the bumper plate. So the, the barbell, the barbell, which is a bar and the plates, it actually that whole lifting bumper plates and, and bars that don't break or bend came from, from Aleko. So it's a pretty cool little. That is a very cool story. I'm glad, yeah. Wendy, I'm glad you asked that because now I know. Oh, well, when I saw it, I'm like, dude, we got to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and it was, it was cool. It was, that was really interesting to find out. And that's, a, that's on the website. They have some big stories that goes into it. I'm going to check it out now. But Rod, as we move now, you, you know, you've always been, um, you know, a huge part of what NASM created, but, you know, can you give us a little idea of what the NASM and Aleko relationship looks like? And, you know, maybe some of the things you're up to uh, in that. Yeah. So the, the relationship was something that was important to me because obviously having a legacy and a history with NASM, it's always been near and dear to my heart, uh, especially since PTA Global was purchased by the same company that owns NASM and then basically got dismantled. So my, my only two big things in life were under the same umbrella, which was owned by the same person, Neil Spruce. So God bless Neil Spruce because he's been so much in my life. But I wanted to reach out and start creating relationships so we were able to collaborate. One of my personal, I guess one of my personal ethos is, is just, I want to be collaborative as possible because we're better together than we are individuals. And too many times in the industry, people try to just isolate and individualize and they don't want anyone else to come in. And because of the history of NSM and knowing the, the potency and power of it, I thought we could create some type of relationship. So we have that relationship. One of the things that was, recently just developed is they had reached out uh, to me to see if I would be willing to write a weightlifting chapter for the new, new PES textbook. And so that was interesting because having been such a huge part of writing and, and, and developing the CPT textbook back in the day, and then the CES textbook back in the day, which I still have all the copies of all the originals on my computer. And even things that aren't talked about in the CES, yeah. Right. Uh, but <laughs> that's, Wait, a whole, that's a whole different, whole different podcast. <laughs> we know what some of those are. But they reached out. I said, "That's really cool." So it was interesting. I didn't think about it. I'm going to go back and write something for uh, the PES textbook, which wasn't was never in there to begin with. And I know that it's been in there uh, prior to this. But so I w- wrote the weightlifting chapter for the for that textbook and the updated version. Uh, that it's coming out, which I think is going to be fantastic. The the book itself, uh, the chapter, I think was brilliant. 
<laughs> Modest. I have, I have to say that, otherwise I'd be. No, I think it's, it's very helpful, and we try to be as practical as possible with it. So. I'm sure it is. That's, Can't wait to get my hands on it. Yeah, it'll it's it's a it's a good read. It's pretty meaty. It's pretty in detailed, but it's for a purpose. I mean, if you're going to write a textbook about something, you better have more information than you might actually need, because there may be a time when you need it. The more you know, the more you use. And that's exactly a perfect Rodney that Wendy and I were talking about at the very beginning. Yes. Yes. And those of you guys that are just joining us on the Master Instructor Roundtable this week, we have a special guest, Mr. Rodney Korn, who um, is a director of Aleco. And he's talked a little bit about not just his, his past with NASM, but also the collaboration between Aleco as well as NASM today, um, as well as authoring one of our chapters in the upcoming PES, which we cannot wait for it to come out very, very soon. Um, but, you know, Rodney, I know, obviously, I've been with NASM pretty much since the beginning as well, and I know Marty has too, but when we really kind of look through the the history of what we've done, there really hasn't been a lot of talk about uh, Olympic weightlifting or weightlifting in general. So can you kind of tell us, um, you know, maybe why it wasn't such a big deal in the past? I mean, obviously, I think it's it's, it's always been like a huge sport. There's been so much activity in, around it. But can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and, and that's another fantastic question, Wendy, because you touched on one of the words, which it's always been a huge sport. And I think part of the stigma or part of the lack of use or understanding is because it's been a sport and because people see that they're, they're such a high level. Most people only see it at this high level, whether it's you watch the Olympics, like, oh, my gosh, look at all that weight, blah, blah. And that's all fantastic, but that scares people a lot of times. It's like, I, that seems like a very highly skilled movement, and it is. And how am, I, how am I supposed to do that with all this weight, and won't that hurt people? Because that's one of the number one, I guess, knocks against using weightlifting is, isn't that like dangerous? Isn't it going to hurt people? Uh, I know in baseball, that's a huge thing. Is that you, they don't, I mean, they don't do overhead lifts. Marty can tell you that. They don't like doing overhead lifts for any reason, which is probably going to have more injury than don't. So it's a long conversation. That's a whole other podcast. So we're just <laughs> right. going to line all these up, extra podcasts. Okay. Clear your uh, schedule, Rodney. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to have job security. So that would be a good one. <laughs> so I think originally, Mike being, from Mike's point of view, and I can't speak for Mike, but knowing where he came from, obviously Mike's a physical therapist, and he was probably probably one of the most brilliant physical therapists that I've been around and been associated with and owe him so much for what he taught me and probably so much for what he taught me he didn't realize he taught me um, because I was always watching. And when, when we got to the OPT model, he used it, he was coming at it from a very – injury preventive therapeutic standpoint where he was using non-traditional lifting for a lot of the, for, for a most part. And that's where we got a lot of the, I guess a lot of the potency of NASM was from that. We were bringing in things that weren't typically used. There were some people that were using some of the stuff, Juan Carlos Santana, Paul Check were using a lot of things, some of the Gary Gray things that were being used. But Mike had actually put it into a full-blown system and, and used it. So Olympic weightlifting was never part of that. And it wasn't because Mike wasn't, was against Olympic weightlifting. It just never fit into a lot of the clientele and a lot of things that was being used, even though Mike started with a lot of the professional athletes as his mm -hmm. primary clients in, in, Tex, uh, in Arizona, who eventually ended up at Calabasas with us. We weren't set up and we didn't have relationships with equipment companies that were allowing that weightlifting component to be put into the, the OPT model. So that was something that had been talked about and something that I had had an interest in uh, back in that time, but we never actually put it into because it wasn't, it didn't seem to fit the fitness industry at the time. And you have to go back and look at the trends. So there's a lot of variables that kind of go into that, but the trends at the time were stability balls, not necessarily platforms and plates and bars. Right. We're fast forward now. One of the biggest trends is pulling out a lot of cardio equipment and different things and putting in a lot of strength training zones. And i.e. from a CrossFit, the influence that CrossFit's had into the whole fitness training world. That's where now it's become a little bit more accept acceptable. So long story short, that's why it was really never in. So a lot of the variables, a lot of the trends, and then just kind of the, the 
personnel and the population that we were working with and dealing with, teaching the education to. Olympic weightlifting was never a huge fitness component. It was always kind of outside in the strength and conditioning world for the most part. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because like, for example, some people think kettlebells are new, right? Like if they're newer to fitness, they don't understand kettlebells have been around for Ever. a lot longer than the treadmills. Yeah. <laughs> so it's hundreds, been- hundreds of years. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, well, Rodney, I actually want to piggyback off of that, um, if you don't mind, but because, you know, we always, you know, tell people multiple times that the OPT model isn't rigid. It isn't like this is a one size fit all. These are the programs that you have to do and that you have to be creative, know your audience, look at the assessments and figure out, you know, when is it applicable to move them up the phases or when should they maintain? When do you undulate all that fun stuff? So now, you know, especially with what you do every day, you know, for a living, especially being the director of education, you know, for people that really understand the OPT model, where do you think Olympic lifting fits best within the model and how can you explain applying it that way? Yeah. So that's a big question, Wendy, and I'm going to try to be precise. I'm a big person. You remember I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I got to give a little bit of background to let this unfold. So when people say, where would it best fit in the OPT model, having an intimate knowledge of the OPT model it fits everywhere in the OPT model. And that's one of the big misconceptions is sometimes we, we pigeonhole exercises that they only belong in a certain area, but it's how you do the exercise and why you're doing the exercises and the variables that you're using with the exercise. So part of the stigma around weightlifting is that you go from ground to overhead in either one or two movements, depending on whether it's a snatch or a clean and jerk. However, one of the things that has to be realized is that there are various phases or components of each one of those lifts and each one of those phases or components of the the full lift has a unique application in and of itself if you start at the floor and you you go for the first phase or the first component of it that's just that's just a partial deadlift and as you come all the way up that's a more of a full deadlift it just has a slightly different technique than a than a normal power lifting type deadlift and then you go into a, a shrug motion, shrug to a high pull motion. And depending on how fast you move that, will have a whole nother ramification into it. So you're looking at the, the metabolic components behind it. You're looking at the actual mechanical components behind it. And that's where it starts to become very cool because you don't necessarily have to go all the way overhead with something to still use it. And it's like saying, where would you use a deadlift in the OPT model? Well, a deadlift could be used in any component of the dead, uh, of the OPT model. It's what's what are the variables that you're going to associate it with? Remember, the OPT model, yes, does have a little bit of a framework around the types of exercises and the stability you want to go. You're, you're looking for a little bit of instability, but you're also looking to address certain muscle or muscle fiber types. That's the reason for the actual phases of the model. It's not just these exercises fit in that hole. It's no, what are the variables, which when we talk about acute variables, we're talking about what are the manipulations to the stress that you're placing into the system. That's all an acute variable does, what the acute variable spectrum does. It manipulates the stress that you place upon the body. That stress will determine not only what energy system you're using, but what motor units or or fibers that you're using and how you're addressing the system. What are you trying to accomplish and build with that? And so that's why I, I, from, and this is something that has to be understood from the OPD model. If you realize what those phases are and you understand that, then putting in exercises is very simple. The deadlift from a research standpoint, and I use a deadlift because that's a, that's one of the phases of an Olympic lift. If, if I do a deadlift correctly and I'm not worried about max load, which that would go into a different phase of the OPT model, if I'm going for maximum strength and I'm not looking at power, which that's a different phase, but I'm just looking at creating better stability. Let's just look at the lumbar spine and I'm looking at the multifidi muscles. If I just want to hit the multifidi muscles, which are stabilization muscles, by the way, <laughs> and there's local stabilization, a deadlift has been shown to be just as effective as traditional therapeutic exercise to enhance the stability of the lumbar spine. 
So when I know, again, the more you know, the more that things open up. So yeah. we should be wanting to learn more information and not taking that model and throwing it away because it didn't fit my exercise spectrum. It's no, probably wasn't the model's fault. It was probably our fault. Right. Well, from, from teaching in the, in the original days to the learner just saying, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, don't blame the model. It's like, don't shoot right. the message. Ronnie, I think one of the key things that you have uh, impacted me with throughout my whole career now, and again, I have to give you credit for this, is don't think about an exercise, right? And Wendy and I talk about this time, we might call it an exercise. At the end of the day, it's a movement pattern. And when you start to strip back movement patterning, you could talk about how helping someone do a, a bridge or a plank, you know, Rodney's eventually going to help them with any of those Olympic lifts that you're gearing them towards. You're just taking pieces of the more complex movement pattern and you're working until you can start to put these together but the person thinks oh i'm doing a bridge oh i'm doing a plank oh i'm doing a this i'm doing a that and before they know it they're doing a power clean right it wasn't by accident it was a systematic dissection of the complex and you figured out where that person is and then you just build them through the phases through the movement patternings get them to move well then you move them well under load and then before you know it they're doing whatever they need to be doing and they think, oh, today we're doing power cleans. Like, dude, you've been working on this for six weeks. Yeah. And, and to your point, just taking those two exercises, a bridge and a plank. So a bridge and a plank are working your torso. Uh, you're, you're working full body. But mm -hmm. for most people, they think it's the, the torso or what we would call the core, which is technically incorrect. But it still fits. <laughs> is using those, when you're doing weightlifting, you have to maintain the, I say, rigidity of the spine, meaning you're, you're trying to avoid excess motion of the spine because you're trying to get proper transfer from your feet to your hands. Well, it has to go from your feet through your torso to get to your hands. It doesn't just go from feet to hands. So the, that's where the, the whole core and the whole central component of the body becomes so valuable. So if you can plank and if you can bridge those are ex those are distinctly important in doing a form of a dead lift or extinct distinctly important from doing a either what we call a drive shrug, which some people call a second pull or into a high pull. You have to maintain that and you have to be able to have some type of hip thrust, which is a bridge, glute bridge, in order to maximize that. So if you're in a stabilization phase and you were doing core, you were doing planks and you were doing some bridges, you can still, you can add in a deadlift. And then from a deadlift, you can go into uh, what we would call, whatever you want to call it. We call it a drive shrug because it just sounds better. So we're driving through the hips and we're shrugging the shoulders. That is not a difficult movement, but that is a powerful movement. How fast you do it, how heavy you do it, will determine whether you're going through maximal strength or whether you're going through maximal power or trying to get more of a power component. If you're not worried about speed and you're just worried about technique, you're now focusing on the stabilization component. It just doesn't sound and look like the sexy stabilization because it's right. you're not one arm and you're not twisted and you're not trying to stand on stability balls like people used to do way back in the day, uh, which yeah. we do not recommend. That is not the point of this, and that will not be another podcast no. later on. No, that will that is not acceptable. <laughs> that is not, not, not. So for anyone joining us today, Wendy Bats and I have a very special guest, Rodney Korn, who is the director of education for Laco. He is a longtime friend and mentor to both of us. And you got to go back and check out the entirety of this uh, podcast because there's some great information. You'll hear about Rodney's amazing background, his contributions to NASM. And then of course, you're going to find out about the waffle iron. So you're going to have to go watch it now. So <laughs> That's, you know, that's that's how we tease things, Rodney. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah. and waffle. Wow. Is that a great story? Well, we'll <laughs> it again, but we don't have time. It'd be a protein <laughs> waffle. Those are, those exist. They do. They do. Well, Rodney, I, so, um, you know, again, I don't focus a lot of my training, um, on, on weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting, that is, mm -hmm. um, you know, yes, we do different types of Olympic exercises and in, in some of my programming, but like really understanding, you know, proper setup, movement patterns, positioning, what you're calling different things, proper execution, when it's, when you should do things, when you should not do things, um, you know, especially the Rodney Court education way, which again, we love. Um, 
with our NASM audience and anyone that's listening to this, I know that there's a two-day workshop that NASM is going to be a part of, but can you talk to us a little bit about this workshop, when it is, what you're going to talk about, and what we could learn if we attend, which, by the way, I will be there. Nice. Um, and I'm, yes, I'm going to, to Austin. But yeah, anyway. Nice. Um, Absolutely. So what we've just talked about to this point, so if you didn't hear that, you want to go back and hear that. But what we've talked about at this point is the whole purpose why we've at Aleco, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to get people to be an Olympic champion. That's a whole that's a whole separate training process. And what we're trying to do is get people to understand how to perform these lifts. And we break it down and make it step by step and methodical. So we don't try to get them to just perform the whole lift and then figure out where they're going wrong and break it all down. So no, you need to learn the different phases and and we kind of go from a, almost from a top down process. So you're not going to start from lifting things off the floor and going that. You're going to start by understanding what are the different key points or positions within those lifts. How do you need to be set up? What does your stance need to be like? What does your grip need to be like? What is your body position? So we get into just very simplistically understanding the mechanics of the motion, which for anybody who's done any form of training, it's not going to be foreign. They're going to, oh, yeah, I've heard that, especially if you have an NASM background. Oh, I've heard that. I, I, my feet have to be X. My hips and my knees and my shoulders and my torso have to be in a certain position. And then here's the movement pattern that I'm going through. So we break it down step by step. The brilliance of the Olympic lifts is that there are multiple lifts within the full lift that you can emphasize or that you can practice. That also tells us that each one of those has to be sequenced. So if you're having a problem doing the, the very first one, you master the first simple, first simple motion. Do you know how to hip hinge, yes or no? So once you know how to hip hinge, now can you add in some type of shrug motion? Now can you sync that? If you're having problem, then we go back to, did you learn how to hip hinge? Okay, now that you do that, can you go into the shrug? And then you go into, is it a high pull? Depending on what lift you're doing, are you gonna go into a snatch, which is right overhead, or are you gonna go into a clean? That will just have a certain change, which is the, the different, what we call a pull under. Some people uh, call it a turnover pull under and then there's a catch phase so we break it down so you specifically know what you're doing and we're not focused on weight that's the one thing people always ask well how much weight we we're using broomsticks we're using pvc pipes we have training bars at the facility that weigh basically tw uh, t about 11 pounds or five kilogram bars or 10 kilogram bars and then we have training plate so we have this progression where you're using very simplistic weight but enough to where the body has some type of feedback so when when you show up on june 11th and 12th over a weekend which by the way if you if you come live you get swag and you get dinner and he has to pay for paying for dinner so you're going to want to show up because you get a free dinner you get time to interact with all of us but what you're going to do is you're going to learn these lifts and you're going to learn the segment components. And what we find is most people who come there enjoy it because it's similar to what they've done or have seen or done before, but now they're actually learning it. So there's a little bit of a challenge element, not like we're going to try to make you these Olympic lifters. There's a challenge element. And now you have this new skill that you're learning or how to sync and link movement patterns and that stimulates people. That's one of the best ways to actually create a learning environment and to create a kind of an emotional response that's a positive emotional response is you have to have some form of challenge in order to do that. And it's, it's a very simple process, step by step, and we just talk about how to do it, practice time, how to coach it, what are some of the main cues that you can give for yourself and or when you're teaching others. You'll walk away being more competent for sure at the lifts and more confident in doing them and helping other people to understand them. It's not rocket science. You're not gonna be on stage the next week doing an Olympic <laughs> lifting competition unless you just- Come on, Rodney. <laughs> even, people, even people who are already accustomed and understand Olympic lifting or have done it before, we've had many people come through the course where there's always something that you can learn or there's always something you realize, ah, that's where one of my flaws were, and this is how I can help correct that. So that's the potency behind it. Very where simple, is that? very practical. Where is it at, Rod? I didn't hear it. It'll be in Austin, Texas at the Aleco headquarters there. Brand new headquarters, so it'll be awesome. You'll be able to see the, the whole Aleco 
team. You'll be able to see the, the, uh, the, the facility that we have, a training facility there. You just checked my calendar. It's open. Got to, got to get there. Got to get yeah. there. It's going to be fun. Plus we'll be there. Uh, the, the person who will be teaching with, with me, she, she's one of the Aleco educators, Lauren Heiser. She's fantastic. She's an ex Olympic lifter, but more importantly, she understands people and connection. She's very fun. She's very engaging. And we'll both be going back and forth and, and teaching. And she does, she's the one who will do a lot of the educational instruction on the lifts themselves. That's her expertise. And I just provide the uh, banana pin analogies. I'll be there to help out with, with everything as well. As you were talking about that, and again, this wasn't anything we had talked about before, is my first instinct was, you know, the vast majority of people, like you said, are not going to go into a gym and try to do two, 300 pounds. So they, they stay away from it. But if you are NASM, what's the final part of our corrective exercise is integration. These are phenomenal ways to learn integration techniques because they're total body. And again, it, as Roddy said, it gives you some skills to work at. Who doesn't want to become better at something? And then before you know it, you may accidentally fall in love with some of these techniques and you may be able to do more than you're capable of. But also when we're all in the gym and we see people, I'm going to use the word muscling through these techniques Imagine how much better they could get if you could share this information for the people who just randomly watch something on YouTube and just start going through these and get stronger. But as any athlete, when you have real crisp form and technique, it's amazing to watch the performance go through the roof. Absolutely. And it, it doesn't it doesn't take long, especially when you're starting out, because for anyone who starts out something, there's always usually a, a, an accelerated learning curve where they can really learn and, and, and progress faster. The more that, you know, obviously it slows down, but you can still fine tune things. And that's what this will be about. It's it's not it's not difficult. It's not hard. It's fun. And like Marty said, it'll help provide a series of exercises that can be extremely beneficial for you. Well, and I'm going to say too, I mean, and, and this isn't just a, you know, obviously hype you up even more than we already have Rodney, but I think any kind of education that you can get from mentors and people that have been in the industry and they understand your background, where you're coming from, especially if you're coming through NASM or, you know, Rodney, with you having the background, the way that like you break it down, it's so easy to understand. And I think this two day workshop, being able to spend time with you, spend time with all of us that will be there. I mean, is, is first of all, we haven't had that face-to-face -face interaction in so long. Like mm -hmm. I'm learning, you know, I'm excited about that because to me personally, I learn better by visually being there and doing the hands-on technique. So I'm excited to be a part of this, but you know, those of, you know, can you tell us like, where do you sign up for this two day? You know, is it, is it just face-to-face? -face? Can you find something out virtually? Do you get CEUs? Can you kind of talk through that a little bit more? Yeah. So it's both live and then we'll be live streaming. So there's two different ways you can do it. Remember the live people get the swag, they get the dinner and they get the, the actual hands-on training. The live stream uh, will, will get all of that and experience it and see it, whether you watch it live when it's happening or you'll have the link so you can access it whenever you want to it becomes more of an online situation. So there's both ways that you can do it and that's up to you. The sign up will be, and I'm sure you guys will have the link and everything. The sign up will be through the Inspire 360 platform that we have. So there'll be a link that you can go to and you can see there'll be a live or a live stream, whichever one that you want to do. The cost is the same. Uh, NASM people do have a 30% discount code. Those of you are in the pro thing, I just want to mention that because that's a pretty big deal when you're talking about the course. Uh, course isn't that expensive. It's course only three ninety nine. There are CEUs. There's CEUs for the NSCA and there's CEUs for NASM, obviously. So just in case anyone else has dual certifications that they're worried about, it, it'll cover that. So, so Ronnie, are these eight hour workshops, six hours, four hours? Like, what's the timing of them? This this will be a two day workshop. Mm -hmm. So it'll be the the eleventh and the twelfth of June. And day one, we'll be covering a lot of the technique. Day two, we'll be doing a lot of the, the coaching and programming and, and actually working through. So you're, you're not only learning to do it yourself, and this is where it becomes really fun, is you learn how to do it yourself, but then you also learn how to kind of coach other people up on it. So you get the best of both worlds. And that's why I say you'll walk away competent and confident to both do them and help others do them. 
Excellent. Well, I know I've learned a couple things today. One about waffle irons. Yeah. And two, I now have a continuing education course I'm already uh, going to put on the calendar. So I'm in. That's it. There it is. I know. So well, let me ask you, Rodney, you know, for those that are listening today, we want to thank you, A, for joining us on the Master Instructor Roundtable with our special guest, Rodney, Rodney Korn, talking about waffle irons, the history of NASM, you know, weightlifting just in general, and then how we encompass that into our programming and our phases of training of what we know today. The exciting two-day workshop that's going to be held in Austin, Texas um, in June, you can join virtually or in person. So we're super, super stoked about that, especially with our partnership. But Rodney, kind of words of wisdom. So do you have any takeaways um, for the people that are listening? Don't box yourself in and always look for what, what is possible. Meaning, I'll take the OPT model, same with weightlifting. People put weightlifting in a box and they say, well, this is what it is, this must be what it is. Don't get lost in that because there's so much more to it and there's so many things you can do with it. And the more you understand and the more you know, the more you get to use it. OPT model, same way. Don't get locked into here's what it, what it was said to be or here's what it, Look at why there's phases. First off, ask yourself the question, why were there phases? Why are there different phases? What do those phases mean? And then how can that be beneficial? And that's where, for me, it's always, you, you want to be curious, uh, but you want to have a purpose for that curiosity. It's not just to be curious and ask questions for questions' sake. It's what's the purpose of things? Look behind the curtain. Is, is what I would say. Always try to look behind the curtain, see what's there, not just what is seen. Because what is seen isn't always what is real. There's more meat behind that curtain. Excellent. Well, Rodney, I know Wendy and I could spend hours talking to you. We could uh, just, we have so many things we could talk about and go on and on about. But first and foremost, thank you for your commitment to the industry. Thank you also for pouring into people like Wendy and I. I know that you, um, you do it for a lot of reasons. We know the why, but you know, I, we really do value the fact that you love giving your knowledge because as you've told us, you know, somebody had to pour into you and we do as people that have been mentored by you, we take that very seriously. And we talk about you all the time that we owe the industry and others, the time and patience that you gave us early on in our career. And I know I'm sure I can be friendly. I hope that I have the impact on one person in their career as much as you had on me. So I can't sure. thank you enough for that. Excited to see what you're up to and definitely looking forward to seeing you in June. Yeah, I, I deeply appreciate you guys allowing me to be on here. And for everyone that's watched or will watch or has watched, thank you so much. And I hope that you got something from this and love to see you and meet you in person. And I can't wait to see both of you in uh, Texas here pretty soon. Yes. Well, well, thank you. And Rodney, how can people, if they have questions, um, can they get a hold of you? Do you mind giving out your contact or? Yeah, absolutely. They can, they can email me. So my email is just rodney.corn, just like my name, at eleko, just like you see, E-L-E-I-K-O.com, rodney.corn at eleko.com. Feel free to email me, reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to do what I can do. Awesome. Well, and if you guys have questions for Marty and I, you guys can always contact uh, me at wendy.bats at nasm.org, or you can find me on Instagram at wendy.bats13. And Marty? Yep, my uh, email, marty.miller at nasm.org. And then Instagram is dr.martymiller72. So Rodney, once again, uh, thank you so much for everything. And we look forward to seeing you in June. Thanks everyone for attending, and we'll see you next week.